Thank you. So yes, I gave a talk last time about uh, DRAM KMS and graphics in the Linux kernel, and part of the feedback I got was that I killed half of the audience with the level of technical details. So hopefully this won't be the case today. Uh, I'll keep this less technical, at least the technical parts on the slides, you're not supposed to read them. They're just that small prints to, uh, to impress you and to show you how some parts are really difficult and you should really avoid them. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about testing in general. That's an extremely borrowed topic, so I'm going to restrict that obviously to the kernel. That's the topic of the conference today. But even there, uh, I will not address all the testing tools, all the testing infrastructure, all the, uh, all the efforts that were made by well, lots of different companies, individuals, uh, to address the testing uh, problems in the kernel. So I'll try to give you a broad overview of different aspects of testing and a few pointers to, uh, to the different parts. And I will be available, obviously, uh, obviously, for questions now or later by email or whatever conference you can meet me. So I want to start with a short example that's actually not related to the kernel. Um, it happened that I sent a patch recently uh, for a CMake file uh, that fixes LTO, so that's uh, link time optimization uh, detection. So nothing really, uh, nothing really big, uh, small patch there. And I got a review on that, someone telling me, you know, the, those variables that you have there called RET, that's not very good. You should rename that to something that's more explicit, like LTO random works, that's more explicit than write. Uh, and then you can use that variable a bit, uh, a bit later. So I thought, okay, that sounds good to me. So I submitted the second version of the patch uh, with a nice uh, uh, summary of the changes, or the single change there. Uh, and the code just replaces a variable, or the, the right variable, and uses it. And I thought, you know, it's really, uh, really small, small change, so no need to test that. I can submit the patch. Who in this room has never done that? Okay, good. <laughs> so that proves that this talk can be useful to you. So that is famous last word of probably, well, hopefully not too many people, but I got review on V2. And, well, it doesn't work. Made a stupid mistake. Most mistakes are stupid. Uh, I won't go through that, but my state of mind at that time was, oops, I screwed it. I screwed that. I was lucky that someone actually tested it before committing it, uh, that the problem showed up during testing, and that the change didn't hit mainline, mainline because it would had the, it would have broken uh, the the make file for for all the other users. So that's a really small change. And now, if you think about applying that to kernels, and the example I'm going to give you is a driver I'm working on. It's a pretty small driver, you know, just a bunch of files. <sighs> nothing, nothing really major. A very simple device. If you look at the device model in a graph. That's something that looks like that. You know, nothing to be concerned about. Roughly. Uh, yeah, very simple. The user space API is also extremely simple. There's a couple of device nodes that you have to use and coordinate the configuration to get it right. No, nope. day job. Um, so obviously I knew that working on that, I had to do testing. And so my first approach to testing was, well, I'll make that command line oriented, obviously, to start with. So I have a toolbox with a few tools. Uh, I don't want to reinvent my own testing tools. So that's a video for Linux driver, by the way. So I'm going to use uh, the, the tools that were developed by the community uh, because I didn't want to reinvent my own. The third one in the list actually stands for yet another video for Linux test application. So in the not inventing hay syndrome, I'm not doing that great because I'm the author of that one. It predates this project. So I got this toolbox with just four command line tools. And I started with manual testing, you know, make a change to the driver, and then you, or you fire up, uh, you open a console or a serial console on your, on your device, you boot up your device, and you enter a few commands to, to do the test. So this, this device does memory to memory image processing. It reads frames from memory, processes them with various options, write the result to memory. So to test that, I need to feed it a frame, an image, uh, configure the processing, 
get an image written into memory, convert that to a file I can read, open the file, and check whether it's good. So I started, well, with a few really basic commands that I had to just type down in the console. You know, that's just very simple. You just have to remember that every time you want to run the test. Um, and once you're done configuring the, the device there, well, that's just configuration of the media pipeline. Then you have to actually start uh, giving it images and capturing images on the other side. So that's one console, but you need to tell that to the device to open a second one because you're going to have multiple processes that will run asynchronously in parallel. Uh, and I want to have a complete log of both of them on my console. So I open a telnet ten terminal and uh, manually again that command. Tool start. That's to give the images to the device. Now I have to capture them on the other side. So I open a second telnet connection. A second command that looks a bit similar, but slightly different. Then the test will run. And I'm going to capture frames. Again, manually, I enter a command that's going to convert them from a binary file to a PNM file that I can open in an image viewer. And I can finally compare the images. So you can really easy to realize that doing that manually every time that you want to test a patch is not going to scale, especially when you have a quite complex device that can do a lot of things and you have to uh, well, obviously test whether the patch you're writing works fine uh, for the feature that you're developing, but also whether you haven't broken something else. So you want to also have regression tests. So I decided to script that a bit. Uh, so I wrote a script. This is the help function of the script uh, that takes a few options, so it's just a shortcut, basically. Instead of having to type all those long command lines, well, I get to short the command lines. So the first one that you see on the top in the console, uh, that replaces six or seven commands that configure the pipelines, and all, all the configurations are basically hard drive in my script and a big one. I still have to open two telnet uh, connections, uh, as I did before, but again, the commands are a bit simpler, so there's less parameters to remember. I don't have to remember that my video node is actually slash dev slash video node, video nine. The script figures that out for me. So that's that simple. Then, um, in this piece of hardware, I also have uh, a composer, so that's... Uh, basically uh, a, module, a, a processing module that take, takes multiple images and composes them with alpha blending and output something. So instead of having just one input side and one output side, I can have two, uh, two inputs. So that means three telnet connections. Uh, and it can go up to actually four inputs and five in the later generation. Then you have lots of terminals open and you don't actually remember which one corresponds to what and it's it's a real mess as well. I mean, it's definitely the script is useful. It's shortcuts, but it's still extremely manual. And again, I have to run tests to test the features I'm developing, but also to test regressions. So doing that manually, again, didn't scale. Uh, I figured out anyway, it didn't scale when I started getting more bug reports than the number of fixes I committed. And then you realize that there's something wrong. So I decided then to start an automated test, test suite. Uh, I knew that testing was important. Uh, I had spent probably about a year doing that manually uh, because there's always something more important than testing. Uh, your customer will want you or your employer will want you to deliver code that works, but the first part of the sentence that they want you to deliver code. Uh, and then as long as the problems are not code by them or the customers, that's fine. I didn't really feel good uh, delivering code of dubious quality, uh, knowing as I was developing the driver, I was just implementing new features, that more regressions were creeping in. So <clears throat> I decided to still use the same test tools because all the test procedure, I, uh, all the tests I used until, until then were working fine. The problem is that I had to run them manually. So same tools, same, same set of, uh, of tests. Uh, based on the, on the same runtime dependencies, that's the, the URL at the top where you can, uh, you can find the software. Uh, and basically the way it works is pretty simple. I take an input image, I process that on the top through uh, the hardware, I get an output image, and then I compare that automatically 
with one, uh, one reference frame from a set of reference frames I've pre-computed. Um, that worked with the few first tests I implemented. But then my database of images had, well, I have a scaler in the device, so I decided to use just two resolutions. Could use more than that to test scaling, but two was a start, so I have to duplicate my reference frames with two resolutions. Um, I have to test with and without scaling, uh, and inserting a scaler in the pipeline causes artifacts in the images, so I had to create reference frames with those artifacts, or reference frames without. Uh, I had to implement two for composition with up to four inputs, so you multiply it by four options. Uh, and I also had to support 20 image formats. Each of those reference frames were between 300 and 3 megabytes because they were binary files. files. And the result of that is just too much. Uh, when I was approaching a gigabyte uh, that had to be transferred over NFS, uh, every time I wanted to change a test, I thought that there was a problem there. Uh, so I decided to uh, try something a bit, uh, well, hopefully, hopefully a bit more clever, at least I thought at the time. It was to write a tool that would actually generate all those frames on the fly, on the device. So instead of uh, just generating them manually uh, beforehand, and the manual process, by the way, was configuring the hardware with the pipeline I wanted to use and the configuration parameters I wanted to use, and use the hardware to generate the output and then saving that. So that's still a manual process. And every time I added a feature, every time I wanted to test a new format, I had to go through that again and do it manually. So it didn't really scale either. Um, so I started writing this, uh, this application that would generate my test frames. Um, not something extremely complex, written in C. Uh, it has a bunch of options that basically mirror the functionality of the hardware. So that's not, not very complex. And then I ran into, uh, I had to write a new test for a new feature I was developing, which is that, well, the hardware is ca capable of converting RGB to HSV. So two different color spaces or color representations for purists. Um, <coughs> so that's not very complex. If you Google that, Wikipedia will give you a set of formulas. You take the maximum and minimum of R, G, and B. Uh, the delta between the two, and then it's just a few divisions and multiplications, something that's not very complex. So that's implemented in my hardware. And I implemented the same thing in software. So if you look, well, at the bottom one, V equal maximum of R, G, and B, that's very simple to implement software. No issue there. The saturation value, S, well, there's a division. So when you divide, you have to round. So how do you round? Well, you have to round the way the hardware does. Otherwise, the frame that's going to be output by the device, well, by, 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 by the software, will not match what the device, out, device outputs. Uh, and it turns out that the hardware, small trick. So rounding is quite simple, except when you have to round a value that just half. So you have to round 4.5. Do you round it down to 4 or up to 5? Well, it turns out that the hardware rounds that value down uh, for values that are up to 128 and up for values that are over 128. Took a bit of time to figure that out because that's not a document in the data sheet. That's internal processing to the hardware. The documentation will just tell you it converts RGB to HSV. Uh, the output value is between 0 and 255, and that's it. Still not very complex. Uh, I figured out that my output values wouldn't match the hardware. I checked the difference, realized that everything that's above 128 in some cases is an off by one difference. My values are always uh, higher than the, the, the ones that the, the hardware gives me. And then I tried this and it works. Then going back to the formulas, computing age is a bit more difficult. Uh, there's more rounding, there's different options there, so I tried to get something working and I couldn't, couldn't get something that was working very quickly. So I sent an email uh, to my contact point at the customer and telling them I had a problem with that, so I had a problem to implement testing, and I said, can I get a bit more detailed information from the hardware? Surely it's no big deal. I mean, knowing how the hardware 
rounds value when performs a division, how it does a multiplication. That's no big secret. And the answer I got was, well, actually, no, that's a big secret. So if you look at the date of the email, it was in the evening at September the 6th. I wasn't really happy with the answer. Uh, and so I started talking with a colleague of mine and uh, well, a friend of mine, I see as well, who had worked with similar piece of hardware. And less than half a day later, I committed a uh, patch uh, to my uh, image generation tool that actually implemented the proper algorithm by reverse engineering what the hardware was doing. I haven't really reported that to the customer. They might have known, they might know or not. It doesn't matter too much. But the point here is that if you want to perform testing and if you want to go up to a level where you really want to test um, details of the, of the of your device and of the, the features I implemented, the way your device works, and especially when it comes to, um, to imaging, so video for Linux, display, whatever, if you really want your test to be pixel perfect, uh, there's quite a few challenges there. And it's the same thing, it's even worse actually if you want to test audio, for instance. You output an, an analog audio link, uh, you want to capture data compared to what you've output to check the noise that you've generated. Well, you can't capture a WAV file and compare them with this. That just doesn't work. Uh, so there's possibly some uh, signal processing involved, reverse engineering of what the hardware does. Uh, because most of the time, even though the, in this case, my customer wanted me to perform tests. Well, they were not ready to disclose extremely secret detail as how integer division was rounded. Um, so I ended up getting a tool that was useful for, for my test. And so that's just the, the tool that generates the reference frames that I can, I, I can use to compare them with the results. Um, and then I started writing a set of test scripts because the purpose of the test suite is not just to generate the frames, but to actually run a set of tests uh, for a bunch of hardware features uh, and then tell me whether they pass or fail. And the, um, the way I started is that I checked online and I tried to find something I could use as a base. Um, is there a test suite for my device? Well, certainly not. Um, is there a test suite related to video for Linux devices? Well, there's a test tool that can be uh, used to test compliance with the API, but not really whether a device works the way it's expected to work. Um, so there wasn't really something I could reuse as is. Uh, and I decided to write my, uh, my own set of scripts based on what I had before. So based on my manual testing scripts. Uh, and I wanted them to be obviously much simpler to write because the core, uh, the core library of my test suite is something that it can take a bit of time and effort. Uh, but I wanted to make it easy for me and other people to add other test cases. So there, well, test scripts basically spans two screens. Uh, it first sources the, the library that I want to display because that one is pretty big. Uh, and calls a test init, test init function with a set of features that are needed for the test. I have multiple instances of my device in the SOCs I use. They don't all have the same feature set. And so this can be used to make sure that the, that the, the script will, will select a device that has the features I need. Uh, and then the test itself, well, there's a test run function at the, at the button, let's call it's a library function, and that's going to eventually call, after initial, initializing internal parameters, call the test main function. And there, I'm free to do whatever I want. So this is here, pretty simple test. I loop over a set of defined formats, and I do call a single function for each of them to test whether the device can generate that format at the output properly. Um, so there's a set of helper functions, provided by library, configuring the pipeline for the format, configuring, uh, uh, and then running uh, output and capture on the video nodes, uh, finally graphic frames, and a final function called compare frames that will compare the output with the results and give me, uh, give me whether the, the tests pass or fail. Uh, so that's the basic structure of the, of the test scripts. That's how they look like now. When I started, the first version I committed to the public, public repository was slightly more complex. It was looking like that. 
Um, well, because there's a few features that are available in the test suite, like logging. That's something that you definitely want because it's really nice to have tests. But when they fail, uh, if you get a failure report, you want to check why it failed. Especially when you have a problem that's not always reproducible, uh, when you have race conditions, for instance. Uh, you try the same test on your computer and you try the same test yourself and it doesn't fail immediately. So having good logging with as much information as possible is really useful. And so I had logging built in every test script, like you can see here. Uh, and it makes writing new tests, which can be something complicated. Uh, and so I spent time moving those features that I needed on pretty much in every line in the test script, moving them inside the core library so that they wouldn't have to be dealt with manually. And that's also an important lesson learned. Uh, if, you, uh, if you want to have a test suite that can grow over time and can, that, get, that can cover all the features of your device, uh, you need to make it as easy as possible to write a test, even if it's going to take at some point a few days uh, to move logging inside a call uh, or refactoring what you have. Uh, it's much better to do it early than later because one of, the, one of the thing with test suites as well is that it will grow over time with new tests. The more tests you have, the more difficult refactoring will be, obviously. Uh, so how do you decide what to test? That was my second question. Well, the Initial approach was one feature, one test. It's called unit testing. Uh, so I wanted to test all the features available to make sure they worked. That also works great as documentation, by the way. Uh, I've received, every time I develop new features for the driver, uh, my customer asked me, okay, how can I test that? How can I use it? And so I sent an email with an explanation uh, what command lines they had to, uh, to run to test that and what devices, what options. Uh, now I write a test case and I just send a simple test script with my deliverables and they can reproduce them, reproduce it locally and they can check the script and see, uh, see how, how it works and how to configure the device. Uh, the other thing that's quite important as well is one bug, one test. Even if you have a good test suite, there will always be bugs that will creep in and will, uh, that, you, that, 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 that the test will not catch. So when you catch a bug at some point manually, it means that you were lacking a test. You were lacking a test that would catch that bug for you. So every time uh, nowadays I find a bug in the, in the driver, I try to write, to write a test script that will catch that. So it allows me to test the bug fix and it allows me to test for aggressions at a later point to make sure that the bug doesn't come back. The third one that might be a bit less obvious is one on feature, one test. So usually you're gonna concentrate on the features. You're gonna say, okay, when I tell my device to do this and pass these values through this API, uh, then I expect this result. But most of the time you will not test the negative cases. Like, if I pass those two flags, uh, it's not valid to pass them together, and that should be rejected. Um, that's not feature as such, but it's part of the API. And if you don't test that, then you open the door for people to start using that combination of flags that what's not supposed to be supported for all kind of purposes. And there will always be someone very creative uh, using things that you didn't expect. And given the rule we have in kernel that regressions are under load, uh, you can't really take that back at a later point if there are people using it. Or people would scream saying, okay, that used to work, but I upgraded my kernel to 4.10 and now it's broken. Well, it's your application that's broken, but still, uh, that's a kernel issue. So every time, and that's mostly not really when you add feature, but when you expose new APIs, you extend the APIs, you use the APIs for something new. It's quite important to test those cases that are not supposed to work. Um, so that's a summary of the, of the test suite that I've developed called VSP test. The device itself is called, called VSP. It's a video signal processor. Uh, that's obviously not the first test suite that has been developed for the Linux kernel or for drivers in the Linux kernel. We have a several tests that are internal to the kernel. Uh, so we do have 
a bunch of self-tests that actually can be enabled through kconfig. So some drivers, we actually have test drivers uh, that can be enabled so that they will run at boot time uh, tests for different features of the kernel. Um, we have a set of self-tests that live in the tools testing self-test directory of the kernel that can be run as well. Uh, we also have virtual drivers. I've put that in the parentheses because they're not really tests as such, but it can be useful to implement testing uh, to serve as references or when you need to test communication between several devices. Having a virtual driver for a virtual device can be uh, can be useful there uh, to avoid trying to catch bugs uh, involving multiple components when you don't know on which side the bug is. One very good example of that. Uh, is when you want to test, uh, I got a board where I want to test HDMI capture, there's an HDMI in port. Also have an HDMI out port. I loop them out to in, then I can capture what, whatever I display. If it's not right, I can't really tell whether the problem is on the input or the output side. Um, so in that particular case, the virtual driver won't help, uh, but for some of the test cases that can be useful to isolate, uh, isolate the failures. And we do have a bunch of external, to, ex external tests and test suites, at least just a few here. Uh, what I noticed is that even though testing is becoming quite uh, a hot topic these days, I mean, it's been on the agenda of the Kernel Summit for a few years now, certainly this, this, uh, certainly this year, did quite a few mails that were exchanged on that topic. Um, there's no real centralized effort to, well, either centralized test for the kernel, even though I don't think that's really needed, but centralize an infrastructure. When you have to write a test script, <coughs> writing the test is one thing, then you have to run the test. Um, and if you want to run a test script and use the output of that test script to generate reports, well, you need to be able to pass that output from software. So there are multiple ways to do that, and depending on the, on the tests I've found, uh, some of them will just uh, exit with a return code at zero, non-zero. Uh, some of them will print fail or success to standard output. Some of them do to standard error. Uh, so there's no real standardization there which can make it a bit difficult to read to, uh, when you want to implement a new test suite to actually know what to do. It's not a big deal, uh, but it's one of the areas when I expected to uh, have a bit more guidance and find a bit, uh, bit more unified efforts in the kernel. Um, so when you have test suites, as I mentioned, you have to run them. Otherwise, it's quite pointless. There's a concept that uh, is also kind of a buzzword today. It's the continuous integration. Continuous integration itself is actually not just testing. It's a development model. Uh, it's a development model where you continue to see cycle uh, between, well, you start with development, you commit that, you commit the, the result of your development to repository, uh, and because it's called continuous, those commits are gonna be frequent, and that's gonna be to uh, <coughs> a branch that is shared by all the developers or the whole team uh, on the project. Then that's gonna go automatically through a build, that's gonna be tested automatically, possibly involving manual tests, depending on the size of your organization, you could have budget to hire a testers team that will run some manual tests on all the builds or a subset of the builds. Uh, and then the test results have to loop back to development uh, and they have to, uh, to, to arrive to, or to, to the developers in a relevant way uh, so that if you introduce a bug, then you're gonna get in a timely manner not two months later when you switch to a different project, but in a timely manner, uh, relevant information of the problems that you have created so they can fix them and keep looping like that. So that's a summary of the continuous integration process. But before, before we go to, to that, I'd like to remove the continuous part and talk a bit about integration itself. Um, that's a bit less of a holy grail for testing, but that's still something that you can get extremely wrong. Um, so integration is, well, if we start with testing, uh, remove the continuous part, well, you develop, you build, you test yourself. That's pretty simple. 
That's the first part without involving integration. Integration is going to be the next step that's going to take your results of your development, that's pass the test, and integrate that in a code base that's shared between developers, between teams, or with the whole world, depending on your release schedule. Um, usually, when your team grows beyond, well, single developer or a few developers, you'll want to split that. You will want to split development and testing. Uh, and if you have dedicated testers, well, you need to share the code in, in a way. So you need to commit the code to a place that can be accessed by the testers. And usually the infrastructure you will get then is that you have a repository where you commit the code. There's going to be build bot that will build an image from that. And then there will be tests that will be, be run either automatically or manually or partly manually. Even if it's totally automatic, you still need to commit that to a repository that can be accessed by the bots. I've seen that being implemented quite recently in a project where I call that not really integration, but disintegration. Uh, disintegration of the quality and of the developer experience in the sense that tests were run on the master branch. So when you were developing something, you had to get that integrated in the master branch, and then only QA would go through that and report the problems. After you've well, broken the experience for everybody in the team, at least everybody working in the same area as you, possibly even broken the build. Um, so that's a mistake that I didn't think was really possible, especially in a large organization that is used to deliver lots of products and, and software, but that it actually happened. Uh, you obviously want, in a proper system, to commit to a development branch or testing branch in a controlled fashion uh, and have a testing infrastructure there that can be shared with the developers. You want the tests, at least the non-manual ones, to, uh, to be runnable on the developer, developer systems. Um, and you also, uh, you also want a way for developers or possibly integrators to trigger those, uh, those tests and those builds manually. Because committing to master, having one nightly build on master, and then going, getting that nightly build through QA, well, that just results in lots of screaming, usually. <clears throat> so if we go back to CI, we have seen development over the past few years, uh, a bit more than the past few, past few actually, uh, of a few CI tools, or tools actually can be used for CI. As I mentioned, CI is a loop. Uh, so it is usually the development part is not totally scriptable. Uh, that's good for job security. Um, but the first one I want to talk about is a build bot called Zero Day. Uh, that's a project that uh, started at Intel. Uh, and that is now invaluable for kernel development today. I mean, most, if not all, of the maintainers rely, partly rely on that. Uh, the idea is that zero day will perform a kernel build, uh, static semantic level testing using different kind of tools, and will perform patch by patch tests. So you push your code to a git tree, your kernel git tree. If your git tree is monitored by zero day, and if you have a public git tree, you can request that. Uh, zero day will start building the kernel for every patch in the series you've, uh, you've pushed. Um, if you have multiple branches, it's going to build the code for every patch in all of those branches. And then it will, well, if it succeeds, nothing happens. It's, you don't get notified. You can subscribe to notification for, for success, but that's quite a lot of emails, so that's uh, opt-in only. Uh, but if it fails, it sends you an email. It can send you an email that, well, the build failed. Uh, in this case, I got an automated email telling me that uh, there was an error in my device tree file. Um, so it's going to tell you what it has test tested, which commit is at fault, uh, where, well, what's the error message, possibly the location uh, of the error. But it goes be beyond that. As I mentioned, it also runs uh, 
set of static uh, syntax uh, checking tools and static test <coughs> static test tools on the code. Uh, and one of them is uh, Coxinelli. It runs a bunch of Coxinelli scripts. And when it does that, it can actually not only report errors, but also send you a patch that fixes the problem. So it, you get an email saying, oh, by the way, the code is pushed out in your development branch. Uh, I've compiled that. It compiles, but this, I believe, is wrong, and here's the patch to, to fix that. Uh, and you get that for all your patches and all your branches. Uh, and that's a, a sample email uh, that told me, okay, there's no need to set a field in a structure there. Um, so ask me still to review the patch. It doesn't commit the patch. It doesn't commit to fix uh, automatically. I don't think people would, would like that. Uh, but it sends, it sends a patch to me by email. I can just apply it if it's right. Um, and the patch looks like this. So it's from the cable test robot. Uh, it has a valid sign of by line, not by robot, because you're not you, you're supposed to use your real name inside of by. You can't have a machine signing the patches. Uh, that has legal implications. So there's uh, <coughs> Feng Wang, uh at Intel, who I developed the zero-day testing, signs the patches automatically. Uh, and you get a patch that you can apply, possibly because I push lots of patches in testing branches on my trees, I end up, I end up folding that in, in my patches before sending pull requests. Uh, zero day also tells you that it provides a one hour response time around the clock, hence the zero day name. Uh, well, in practice, you can have done time, it can be issued with the tools, but mostly it's very fast. Uh, I mentioned that the information provided to the developers during continuous integration has to be uh, provided in a timely manner. Uh, one hour delay is definitely timely. Um, it also performs on x86 only, uh, runtime tests, performance testing, uh, power consumption testing, and check for regressions. It doesn't do that on every patch in your branches, because that would take quite a lot of resources. But when it finds a regression, it will automatically bisect your branch and tell you at which point the regression was introduced. That's very useful as well. A bit less so for me because I mostly work on ARM, uh, but such a feature is definitely useful. Um, another continuous integration tool I wanted to mention is the kernel CI.org infrastructure. There will be a talk about that. Uh, that's tomorrow, right, Kevin? Um, so I won't go into in too much details, but as you can see there, that's a diagram from the from Kernel CI our website. Uh, you can see the continuous integration loop uh, that uh, I've showed before. So there's development. Uh, Kernel CI monitors a bunch of Git trees. It's going to build them. It's going to boot them on boards. Uh, possibly perform tests, so boot testing is one of them, but you can have also mod and test. I mean, it's a tool that's under constant uh, development, uh, so more tests will also be added in the future. Uh, we're discussing uh, a bit early on the kernel submit mailing list whether we could integrate the, the VSP test suite uh, that, that I talked about into that, so uh, the, expect the test suite to grow over time. Uh, and it generates reports. Uh, those reports are available on the, on the web. They also send, uh, so there's a dashboard that's available with all the jobs and all the, uh, all the failures that it will detect, all the successes, successes as well. Um, and uh, if, let's see if that works. Um, yeah. <clears throat> if you go to the URLs that, uh, that are over there, I'll open one of them here. Um, do I get that on the right screen? There we go. Uh, so it's gonna, uh, the dashboard tells you the, the, the tests that have been uh, run on that particular version and particular, particular tree. Uh, there's a bunch of labs around the world. 
uh, that uh, that kind of perform testing. And for each of them, it will give you, in this case, the bars that have been tested uh, and the, the test results for booting uh, that kernel of different boards. <clears throat> so that's the rest of the email. Tell me the report, okay, this uh, uh, few, there's one test that failed and a few offline pl platforms that were offline. Um, those test results are sent to the kernel build report list. Uh, so if you subscribe to that, you get lots of build reports uh, from kernel org and from a few build bots. Uh, mentioned two of them here. I don't think there's other ones at the moment, at least in the, in the archive. I've checked a few days ago. That, that, that was the three, three of them. But it's quite a lot of information. Uh, I have to confess that I don't uh, always read uh, through those emails in a timely manner. But there are people who do, uh, and so sometimes that's well, quite often actually that helps generating uh, generating patches as well and fixing issues. So the mailing list has uh, quite a bit of traffic and test by build testing or boot testing or possibly other tests in the future, a uh, bunch of kernel kernels on a bunch of boards. So that's it on my side. Maybe one or two minutes late. Uh, any question? Actually, I just want to ask: Did you ever look at any tests? Yeah. So I did. Uh, that's not something that I could use as such for my use cases and multimedia testing. Uh, I haven't mentioned it here because, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, I've mentioned a few of the, of the testing projects that have been developed, but there's a bunch of initiatives that have been developed by lots of people and going in all kinds of directions. So we don't really have a, a centralized place, unfortunately, where you can go and say, OK, if I want to do kernel testing, what are all the available options that I have? Uh, but yeah, if you want to, to briefly introduce Kata, I think you're in a better position than me to do that. Well, I just say it's in the tools, uh, if you go to the download here, when it's kernel, it's in tools, testing, a test. Uh, basically, you just make a config file, it's made for testing an external um, machine, whether it's a VM or a separate, I use both for VM as well as for, uh, uh, what's it called, I have a bunch of test boxes. And you can set, once you set up the config file, I usually have each of my test boxes have its own config file. So I have not done a make, uh, to build my kernel, I don't do make, make modules, make modules install. I usually do, uh, I do development, or I, I need my full VMAX and do some development, then I do K test, machine config file, then read Facebook until it's done and booted. And what it does is it will build the, build the kernel, install the kernel onto your box. Boot up and reboot the box. And if anything fails along the way, it just tells you it does a report afterwards. And then it, it also has the uh, option of running a test as well. If you want to run a test, make sure it doesn't. So actually, I've been able to, that's why I've been looking at my Facebook account on Facebook quite a lot because uh, <coughs> K test is always running for me. And it's also how I do, it has a patch check. So to make, uh, before I submit anything to Linus, I have like a 13 hour test that K test takes off. And one of the things it does is like, if I have like 20 patches I'm going to push, it will check out each patch, making sure each one does. So this was written before the zero day bot was done. Yep. So I usually kick off paint tests and I push my uh, repo up to my kernel that morning and see, okay, who wins? Zero day or not. Yeah, it works with all the machines out there. Yeah. And it could work for your VMs or external. Getting it set up is required. It uses basically anything you can do a shell. It requires standard input, standard output. Monitor a box. That's just the hardest thing. I used to use NetPack or yeah. something to uh, monitor like a console that a serial console. So it's harder to find boxes with serial consoles. So that's where that's the, the biggest problem is. Once you can get past that, it's better. And there's examples in the network. But yeah, it's a long throw. <laughs> Good catch. Not yet. So that's my next step. Uh, I've developed this test suite. Uh, I can run, run it on my system, and I do that whenever I develop and submit patches. Uh, and the next step is to actually integrate that in a test runner that can run with a board farm, uh, so that I can do regression testing, for instance. Um, it might be a bit less useful when you have tests that really target a single driver. Uh, 
because it's very uncommon that someone else working on a different part of the kernel, uh, or even possibly contrast structure in the, in the subsystem, will actually break things that will only be noticed by one of your tests. Like if someone makes a change in video for Linux core that breaks things fundamentally, usually it will break on lots of drivers, uh, not just mine. Uh, so patches that do not touch my driver usually will not cause functional regressions. Uh, it's different when you want to do performance testing, when you want to do power consumption testing, for instance, where there's lots of uh, possible offenders in the kernel that can make your life absolutely awful. Um, so in my case, it's a bit different, but still, I want to be able to run that at home, especially when I'm traveling to conferences. Uh, I don't have the hardware with me, so being able to uh, develop remotely, push that to a tree, and having my boss at home and my test run automatically pick that and schedule the test and having, uh, having a dashboard, that's something I want to do. But I haven't had the time to do, to do it yet. Uh, I'm trying to think about the cases I had. Um, not yet. What happened is that I wrote tests uh, to to catch bugs that I found. And those tests actually triggered other bugs, which I fixed as well. Uh, so that was a side product of testing. Uh, so, but regressions in the few bugs I've caught and, and, and wrote test cases for, not yet, no. Are you even considering using the TDD model the test driven development? Test driven development? Um, so, yes, I'm pretty close from that uh, to, to that. It's, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I want to say I want to adapt one model or another one. I feel I'm in a bit of hybrid position here where it's, so the, the I got featured uh, on this particular driver with this particular test suite, uh, I get requests for features from a particular cons customer. So that's, where the requests come come from. Um, they don't usually have tests for that. If the request is, please fix this problem that we have noted during testing, they will usually send me a test script. That's, well, something they wrote on the side. And in that case, I will indeed start by reproducing it locally, uh, writing a test for it, and then only implementing, uh, <laughs> implementing it on the, on the kernel, so implementing the feature, or fixing the bug. When it comes to new features, the Problem. It actually came up in discussion recently, uh, where the customer asked me whether I could give them the test two weeks before the final deliverables, uh, because they wanted to prepare for testing. And that was a bit of an issue, because usually the reason we write the test at the last minute is, uh, is that, well, sometimes the API changes up to the last minute. So it's kind of difficult to write a test for an API that is not developed yet. You first have to uh, to get agreement and API implemented, and only then you can implement the test. Um, so it's in between, I would say. Okay, there's no more questions. Thank you.